if organizations in this country could actually really optimize the way in which team meetings work, this would have a substantial impact on the GDP of this country as a whole. Um, you know, what they could achieve versus what they do achieve is, is quite a big gulf. So here we go, we've got five for you. Um, so the first one we wanted to think about is when you bring the team together to really think to yourself, is what it does consequential, challenging, and clear? Okay, so it's the three C's. So they sound really good, but what do they actually mean? So consequential. So when this team meets, is it going to have an impact on the team? You know, is it really that people actually in anticipation of what you guys are actually going to discuss is going to have a big impact on the performance of the team? The second thing is challenging. You know, is it the, the content of what you talk about is it, you know, intellectually challenging or, you know, it's actually really quite require the experience and know-how and knowledge of the people around the table and therefore requires the collective IQ of this team to actually engage with this as an issue. And then finally, is it clear, you know, is it just crystal clear what goes into this meeting or what shouldn't go into this meeting? And that requires you to take a bit of a step back and think about the overall governance structure of your team. So what goes into one-to-ones, what goes into project meetings, what goes into the virtual team meeting, uh, what actually needs to be escalated to because we don't have enough authority so it's all really clear what goes into the meeting and then people can come into these meetings and thinking something big is going to happen today i need to pay attention i'm not going to kill time and i'm not going to sit here and whatsapp my colleague while we're in this meeting saying how bad this meeting is um, i really have to pay attention so the second thing is a reflection of the fact that it's virtual um, and therefore we really need to think about the process um, virtual meetings are more tiring than face-to-face -face meetings. So virtual meetings, by their very nature, need to be shorter and therefore more frequent. Um, you know, you need to have clear agendas and papers ahead of time for people to read and feel prepared, particularly in a virtual world, and be very specific in terms of what you want the agenda to do for people to do in preparation. You know, are, is that item on the agenda, is it for a decision? You know, do you want me to make a decision based on this? Therefore, I need some supplementary uh, information or I might need to come with questions. Is it for consultation? So you as the manager are going to make decisions. Um, you're just consulting with me to get my insight. Therefore, you can make a decision. Therefore, you know, you don't mi mismanage my expectations. Or is it for information? You know, we're going to share some corporate messaging or whatever it is. You know, um, a meeting shouldn't really be for information only because that's really boring. And there are other methods of actually sharing that information um, and we can be far more creative about it as well. You know, the meeting should not be an inbox exercise where I as the manager doesn't speak to all of my direct reports individually. Um, you know, it should be things that actually require the team's thinking. And, and if it really is like that, then you have to wonder, is it a real team? You know, is it, does it actually have a purpose? Um, you know, are you an artificial team? And actually you may need to think about dividing the team up a little bit. Um, also, you need to have an annual plan of what meetings should be held and when. You know, when's our planning cycle? Uh, when when do we do our quarterly reviews? All those kind of things. So we've got some real cadence into the meetings. There's a real kind of momentum as well. And really, we also need to keep a record of the meeting. You know, what do we discuss? What actions are we taking? Who's accountable? Who's responsible? User racy, whatever you want to do, um, just to keep everyone involved and up to speed. But also it means as if we're, we're, we're making progress life at work feels quite relentless at the moment if we never feel as if we make progress because we don't measure it then the work feels relentless and that becomes demotivating doesn't yeah. it as well don't it yeah and i think as chair of the meeting it is your responsibility to hold people accountable for, for delivering on the actions that they they agree at a meeting so there's nothing worse than agreeing a load of actions and then nobody does them the week after and then you let that drift and then you end up in a really effective ineffective cycle of you know, you're agreeing actions, but nobody really believes that you have to do them. So they just get left and that creates frustration and, and it's ineffective and you don't get anywhere. And it erodes, doesn't it, over mm. time and the people's engagement goes down and then you yeah. just get what you get. Absolutely. And, and then again, a, a good foundation for that is number three, which is setting team norms. Mm. You know, um, Ruth Magerman and J. Richard Hackman did a lot of research at Harvard on, uh, on the performance of teams. And they found that teams that actually had you know, really clear norms of conduct, um, that was one of the greatest predictors of team effectiveness. There's all sorts of bad habits that are just creeping their way in at the moment. You know, people are distracted, they multitask. 
they don't look at their screen when they look away mm -hmm. all kind of things and that really sort of creates some bad habits also you know how people need to be engaging with each other how they need to be feeding back um you know what they need to be involved in you know do they talk at topics outside of their own domain of expertise all those kind of things are really good to have nice and clear up front and also think about how you want people to be feeling and thinking at the end of the meeting um we don't think enough about that you know this is as a manager this is one of your primary platforms to inspire engage and motivate your team for the rest of the week and to focus them yet meetings often kind of fizzle out it's just okay so that's that then okay you know you want your guys to go back to their workspaces to their busy homes or wherever they're working and you want them to be inspired and focused and part of a team think about how you structure it as well and also you know make use of technology you, know, you may have some shy members of the team use technology just to, to nudge people in private chats if you know that you've primed them in a one-to-one -to, -one to say something in this meeting you know it's a really good practice to do isn't it um number four is is basically just a, another is is really using good facilitation techniques to encourage engagement often teams are too big you know the optimal number, I think, is about 4.6 for team size. Uh, teams are often quite m a lot bigger than that. People get lost or people come to the meeting and they haven't had a chance to develop a point of view about the agenda or it's outside of their expertise. So you can use some really good facilitation techniques to actually get people to develop their thinking in the room, to build social connections with other people and to actually then to articulate it and socialise it and critique each other's ideas. Um, and you can use lots of things on Zoom, which is like room, um, uh, breakout rooms. Um, I'm a, a big advocate of liberating structures, um, a really good body of work that's kind of brought together lots of really good activities um, and you know activities as simple as one two four are a great thing if you're going to make a decision so the way it would work is one is each person individually thinks about the question that you're asking them or the decision to be made um, then once they've done that they then go into pairs and they share what they've been thinking with their colleague and their colleague asks questions and develops their thinking and then you start to bring them back into bigger groups and what that does is that when you do actually have a group discussion everyone has an opinion everybody feels more comfortable sharing it and it's so much richer rather than it really being led by the manager and and often you'll see when it, things are out of kilter because often when i'm doing observations i'll d take a time segment of the meeting and, and make a mark of how many contributions are made by people and and often 50 to 60 percent of the time the person that is talking is the chair and that means that this you're not utilizing the team and you're not using uh the collective iq of the team as well um and then the last one um and this is level A quality research. And that's the importance of, you know, doing debriefing sessions and lessons learned sessions. Um, that's where as a team, you take a step back and you review a decision that's been made and you take the learning out of it. And we, rather than just constantly careering into new actions to be taken, um, we're thinking about um, what needs to be done for us to improve. Um, and it needs to be done in a certain way. It's not finger pointing and being judgmental. It's like, what are the lessons that we can do? And, and one of the things I often encourage teams to do is at the end of a meeting is to spend five to 10 minutes just reviewing how was the meeting for them? What worked well? What didn't work so well? What can we do next time? And that can have quite a big impact on the performance of the team overall, can't it, Danny? It can, yeah. It, it can be really transformative in the way that the team works and, and learns from learns from how it's working. But I would say, be aware that the first few times you do it, it will be uncomfortable. And oh, it's all... clunky. It's, yeah. it's horribly clunky. <laughs> <laughs> but it's worth persevering. So I think as the, the manager or the chair of that meeting, you have to make sure that you don't let yourself and the team off the hook after one meeting because it felt awkward and uncomfortable. So you never go there again. Keep pushing and making it a kind of formal part of your agenda. And you'll find after you've done it two, three, four times, it becomes a much more natural part of, of the meeting and people will be ready for it and they'll be much more willing to share and contribute their thoughts. Yeah, and they'll share things like, you know, on that particular point, I don't really feel as if I shared my opinion as much as I could have. And then you say, well, what did you want to share? And I say, well, I had this piece of information. It's like all of a sudden the quality of your solutions just just triple, don't they, straight away, because you yeah. really are leveraging that collective IQ. And that's what teams are all about. <laughs>